This is The Art of Startup War, and I am your host, Brian McMahon. I am the sensei here at Expert Dojo, the fastest growing startup accelerator in Southern California. Now, in the first two seasons, we answered your questions about how to find investment for your business. We brought in the most accomplished investors in startup in America. You can find it on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Now, here in season three, we're flipping the script. We're going to hear real stories from entrepreneurs who are in the trenches today. In these episodes, we're going to take our guests through the storytelling model called the entrepreneur's journey. We'll hear about what sparked their call to entrepreneurship, help they received along the way, forces they overcame, dark times and revelations. So join us every Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Start the week a smarter entrepreneur. Brian here at Expert Dojo, another brilliant entrepreneur, another phenomenal startup, a great story about how a business is built from nothing in an industry where it is so massively needed. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Scott Ankeny with Planted Recovery. So tell us a little bit, before we go into Planted Recovery, Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about you and what possessed you to start off this company. Oh, that's a great question. It's back. a long answer. It's right? a long answer. I'm going to try and cover some <laughs> some some uh, some long years and some short sentences here. And uh, so obviously I'm in recovery, yeah. right? And um, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people that for the first 11 years it was sort of traumatic, and then the next 11 years I sort of traumatized life, and then uh, you know by the time I was 21 I entered into recovery really early, wow. I'm 47. And uh, so my journey through recovery has also kind of been part and parcel of my journey through entrepreneurship. Go on. And, uh, you know, I basically uh, through, you know, just scraping by on an emotional and physical level in my early years missed college. And by the time I was uh, in my early 20s, I was in recovery. I had a few years of sobriety under my belt. And um, I started selling motorcycles and jet skis for a living and got to really, um, you know, it was a seasonal business. And through that, I lived seasonally and traveled the world on the off, off season. And, you know, through that, all of that, you know, once someone really enters into recovery it be, and, and truly embraces that as a lifestyle and sobriety as a lifestyle, it sort of becomes a spiritual journey at that point. Right, of course. And and that spiritual journey is really about dissecting oneself so that we emerge out of some catharsis state and are able to maintain sustainable recovery so that as we absorb life and life stresses, um, whether it's losing loved ones or employment or, you know, cat- cataclysmic events all the way to just sort of the slow grind of daily traffic. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That yeah. we're able to absorb that stress and be resilient without turning to some sort of out- outer medication, outer substance to take the edge off of ourselves. Yeah. So that became a calling in my life. And um, I started a few businesses, got into some media in my late 20s, um, and started publishing a magazine called Holistic Living Magazine, launched that. Uh, I was about 29, uh, did very well with that, and hit the internet at yeah, the time of the internet when advertising just disappeared. And and so basically... You, you actually had an edge over everybody else because everybody else is in a bar for like at least three days of the week. <laughs> so you're, you you got this business that right. you're running where like right. you're 24-7 right. and you're clear and, and clean, clean all the way through. I know, but it's true. I mean, I just basically jumped 10 years and inside of that, I, I had a couple patents. I uh, started a company um, called Profax, which was like a f- mass fax. Somehow I got a hold of every fax number in the United States and right. cracked open WinFax and started selling that as a ma- you know ad service and you know 
if you got huh. an ad. Faxes were good back in the day. <laughs> but, but there were, was some money there. Now, there, it kind there of was, there was a tail off. Yeah, but. like a quick one, right? Like at the moment <laughs> that it became illegal, it was like, oh, wah, wah. And yeah, but it was a good, it was a good little business, you know. Everybody got them. Like yeah. we would get those, you'd wait, you'd come in in the morning and there was those 20 yeah. faxes waiting for you. I'm still working off my karma. <laughs> <laughs> still working off karma on that. I don't know how many, you know, fake trees I killed for that one. It was but, awesome. It was the first, it was the first proper spamming, but it was right. good spamming. That's like right. nobody minded because nope. it wasn't directed at someone nope. personally, right? Nope. It just came in through the office fax. And I had it and I had those fax numbers broken down the zip codes. Wow. So I was able to sell it to real estate agents and mortgage brokers within your area. So how many faxes would you send out? Oh, we they were going 24/7. I mean, tens of thousands in Come the on. evening. Yeah. Yeah, tens of thousands. I, I can't remember. That was mid nineties, right? Was there a good yeah. return on faxes? This, these are random questions, right? Yeah. But now you got me fascinated. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm thinking I mean, of marketing before marketing, right? Yeah. You don't see many people in the marketing meetings today talking about their fax, their ROI and faxes, right? I barely but I'm remember. but I'm sure going back fifteen years, it was right. a huge one. It was longer than that. This was twenty yeah, twenty almost twenty years ago. Wow. And yeah, the return was quite well. I mean, you know, you're selling monthly services to a mortgage broker for five hundred to a grand to hit, you know, the 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 three miles within their zip code. It was a good return and they appreciated it. And I was also a little too young. I also at the time owned uh, a, a co owned a patent on um basically activated charcoal pad that heated your foot for hiking, camping, and skiing, and really learned distribution and, and how it all worked at that point. And um, so so I moved through that, you know, and, and yeah, and the ROI on, on fax machines really set me up for advertising sales and learning how to work with companies that might or might not be getting good returns. Right. And, and what branding is and really, so that was my like, my entry into owning my own magazine. Uh, and from that, I brought the magazine online and uh, sold, uh, basically sold integrated media. This is 01 to 03 or 04. Sold integrated media where every ad buy you got, you also were online. So I started learning conversion optimization. Beautiful. And um, so, so that brought me uh, through the years, and 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 frankly, I I realized you know everybody believes that oh, like yeah. relationships are skills that are worth building in life, but that's not true. Conversion optimization is a skill everybody should have that's, in every part of their lives. In every, and that's absolutely <laughs> it. I mean, once once you start really understanding how to how to create efficiency, right? Yeah, and, and how to track the science of tracking is you know of, of metrics and all that is. is yeah. <laughs> like, oh, the feedback I'm getting from her tonight is not good. Yeah, no, if right? I go home this evening I, 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 and like... Continuous it, it, improvement. If in like a 2% chance that there's some dinner waiting for me, which is like still always really small, <laughs> I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, okay, love, uh, how is your conversion optimization <laughs> yeah, today? Uh, and the, yeah. uh, I'm making dinner. Yeah, those uh, those roses really, <laughs> next time next time we might add a couple roses to the, the bundle. Right, that's, okay. uh, that's good. So, yeah, but, you know, so talking about the hero's journey through it, like I relapsed. You know, I got sober super young, and, and as I was going through this entrepreneurship, sometimes it was like, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, and I had no money in my pocket, and life was stressful, and, mm. and, and I, you know, I, I'm an alcoholic addict and from the early, early days, and so I relapsed and then had to get sober again. And in that process, what happened was, um, actually over the years, the last 26 years, I've relapsed three times. Mm. And wow. So knowing how to like fall on my face in life and then using these clinical tools that are out there um, to recover myself, right, and, and get back up and really kind of get back into life got me very acclimated to using technology, like thinking in a technology term because I was building these platforms uh, and then applying that to today's modern addiction challenges, which are many, and um, and I'll you know and 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 I think that there's possibly a way where using telehealth technology and the internet infrastructure and the tools and and real true like behavioral economic game mechanics, we might be able to access a lot more people into recovery than they can right now. Right. 
And so, um, so this is where planted recovery came this from. Is where, so did where you get an epiphany? Was it just was it a light bulb that just went off after the second or third relapse where you suddenly thought, hold on a second, something should be out there that does this? Well, I owned a rehab at the time, actually. And so it, it, there was something like that. There was a, a catharsis moment for myself and it was for my clients. So, so as I was getting to know what it took to bring someone from a place of, you know, complete denial all the way through the spectrum of maybe a couple of years of recovery under their belt, because I've gone through it a few times, um, I got into the recovery business and owned an, uh, a rehab in Mexico. Wow. And um, it was a long, crazy journey to get to that point. But there I was in Mexico and the majority of and it was a luxury destination uh, a, a rehabilitation, 30 day recovery treatment program. Um, and as people were coming to us, I was trying to figure out, can, is there any way we can access uh, the, the, the U.S. health insurance system? Because you can't internationally. There's just no way to do that. And so as I was like kind of researching traveler's insurance and what would pay out, uh, I realized that the telehealth infrastructure had come to a point that we could deliver an outpatient clinical program completely online and have the majority of the national health companies pay for it. How can you do that, though? It's amazing. Well, um, so in the continuum of care, right, people start off, well, we, let's talk about the clinical aspect of it. When people start uh, in, into recovery, there's a moment of willingness and a moment of need. And once they hit that point, they start reaching out. And often there's a physical dependency. That physical dependency needs detox. Detox lasts a week. From that point, they go into residential treatment where it's kind of like being in this room. We're cloistered. We're in here for the next 30 days. I'm not going anywhere. Then you step down and kind of enter back into life, and that is called outpatient program. So people, so the continuum gotcha, of care okay. for, that we are targeting, this is where most relapse is. They go from a residential treatment, entering into their own life. The stress and challenges and responsibilities of, li of life are there. And uh, most of the time, people going from residential treatment don't actually have the time. They're, they're, excuse my language, their ass is on fire. They don't really have the time to drive 30 minutes or an hour to an outpatient facility for 12 hours a week. And that, um, that sort of back and forth, the physical constraints on time has created a real opportunity. So this epiphany for you is obviously you're you're in the rehab center, you're watching people, you know we got these people while they're here. Yeah. Like nothing's going to happen to them. We're watching them, we're taking care of them. We know mm -hmm. all of the tricks. Yep. We know when somebody's feeling weak, we can predict mm -hmm. when something bad is going to happen mm -hmm. and then avoid it. But the second they leave, it's game over. It, the chances are pretty low. Yeah, I've been able to do it. So 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 there's not a single person listening to this podcast who's going to mm -hmm. who's going to feel it's a bad idea. Actually, okay. let me rephrase it. There's not a single person listening who's going to feel that it's nothing other than an amazing idea. Great. I want to hit two areas. The okay. first area is what type of market size are we talking yeah. about here? Like how, how many people? Is this yeah. thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands are are more? Let's talk about that. So, um, the total addressable marketplace in the United States for addiction treatment is $35 billion. So as it sits right now... What does that mean, though, as far as people are concerned? 26 million people. 26 million people in the United States? 26 million U.S. adults need or want alcohol or drug, like substance abuse treatment every year. Wow. Here, listen, get ready for these numbers. This, is, this actually is pretty boggling. 8% access treatment. That's it. And what do everybody else do? $2.3 million. Everyone else has their reasons for not being able to access treatment, and they just sort of bounce around the world and bounce off each other and bounce off their families and bounce off their employers. You know, the numbers are staggering. So, uh, and, and the solution that we're offering can actually increase that fourfold, the number of people. And here's how it gets broken down. So the National Institute of Drug Abuse basically says – 26 million people a year, 2.3 of them get into treatment. So that's 
And when you look at that pie of who's getting in and who's not getting in and why they're not getting in, there's a whole other 8%, like another 3 million, a little over 3 million, 8.9, that don't get into treatment because of transportation. They have no transportation. They have health insurance. They've got everything they need, but they can't get there physically, whether it's rural or whatever. So that's once I started looking at that, um, I started thinking of what demographics and what targets coming from a marketing background, who's out there that actually is not getting into treatment and would. And one of the first uh, things that came to mind are deployed military. Right. right. They can't access specialized addiction treatment, and and quite often they're you know there's well we can talk about that. I'm working with Tricare to develop out um, a an, an an online portal that can treat anyone anywhere, and so another one would be uh, parents with small children at home. They just come out of the 30 day program, and they cannot give up that much time, especially if they're single parents with small children at home, they don't have the time to be able to go spend 12 hours at the facility and then another 10 hours traveling back and forth during the week. Totally. Are there other programs out there, online programs to help people? The uh, There are three or four others. So our current competition is broken down as follows. We've got direct competition. There's um, something called Lion Rock Recovery. There's Smart IOP. There's a handful of these and, and they're not exactly targeting it the way we are looking to target it. And I think that's because I'm coming from an internet background. I'm also coming from a clinical background. And my partners are coming from compliance and regulatory backgrounds. So we're learning how to work with the insurance companies who are giving us a billing code for technology-assisted addiction treatment, which does not exist right now. And so we're working with them to create a platform that gets accredited by the Joint Healthcare Organization. And there's a sort of the access. So once you get JCO accreditation, you then work out a contract with these health insurance companies. Gotcha. And because the health insurance companies are very happy to oh, have you supporting their people, right? I mean, because oh, yeah. it reduces their cost of, of yeah of help. N- not just reducing cost, which is, you know, the I mean let's there are studies out there that show an online program will have twice as as twice as effective for completion rates. So the idea of people traveling four days a week for three to hours a day to a facility, the you know going back and forth and keeping that up for 12, uh, 12 weeks, very low. Mm. So just going online and making this more convenient for single parents to do at home, for traveling executives to do on the run, for uh, you know, corpor- uh, employees of large corporations to be able to do while at work and step out for a few hours and step back in. We're finding a lot of support with those employee assistance programs. Anyways, these insurance companies are looking at the outcomes and using an online platform as a treatment tool and having really true, um, you know, a, a true psychiatrist. One of the breakdowns with having a facility is that uh, you're only as good as the talent around you. Mm. With, you know, people are only going to drive to work four or five miles, 10 miles at most. You, bringing this online, getting these insurance contracts, getting accredited with, the, with JCO allows us to go out there and recruit the best and brightest in addiction medicine. And so that also will increase outcomes. Okay. And then I'd love to talk a little bit about what your platform looks like mm. as far as providing a solution to mm-hmm. addicts and then also mm-hmm. how you've managed to build this. Mm-hmm. Like talk, we talk a bit about the journey, but first of all, talk a little bit about what the solution looks like. Okay. Um, so there's three kind of robust components to it. One is a clinical tool. Uh, the other is a user dashboard. Uh, so the the so in 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 our language, let's call clients insurance companies and mm-hmm. patients patients. So the patients will be uh, will have a daily tool that they log into and they'll see their twelve week treatment plan in their dashboard. And then from there, they'll also be able to access daily activities, their curriculum, homework, and videos, and extracurricular activities. Excellent. And that's already in there. That's already in there. We're actually prototyping that out right now. We've currently raised a hundred grand, and we use that just to create our MVP. Amazing. And that's being built out as we speak. Yeah. Um, sometime by April, we'll be getting. You know, we'll be actually having our first clients come through, and uh, we've already recruited off our full clinical team. So, 
Uh, intake is quite simple as I'm doing my job in marketing and conversion optimization and getting people coming in, whether it's through, you know, a bulk partnership with Boeing or Salesforce mm. who have, you know, 10% of their population have addiction issues. That's what it, that's what it is. There's just about, isn't a family in the world that doesn't, you know, in the U S at least that doesn't have, isn't touched by addiction. So, uh, density is not our problem. The, the sheer size of the market's not our problem. Um, and uh, uh, what, what I would say is that, um, you know, the platform itself, as we run our focus groups, we'll have our clinicians be able to use the back end portion for treatment planning. We are uh, licensing that, which is an EHR system. And we're figuring out who we're going to license that back end sort of clinical tool. So the clinicians will be working directly with the users on our platform using Zoom or Skype telehealth. So for a patient, they come up to their computer at 9 a.m. or 12 p.m. or whatever time they log in, they sit down, up comes their dashboard, uh, they see their daily activities, they click I'm ready, and it brings them into a video group where there's 12 people that they're talking about a very specific topic. It could be relapse prevention, denial management, whatever, some subtopic inside of these main groups. And once that's done, uh, they go into a, an individual session where it's just one-on-one, -on -one, and that could be grief or loss or whatever is kind of driving some of their internal stuff that they don't want, that maybe they're not ready to talk about on a group level. Uh, they go into their individual therapy, and then from there they work with the case manager for a few minutes and it maybe some other specialized therapy, such as family therapy, just depending on what each person is dealing with. Yeah, gotcha. And then they're done for the day. Beautiful. And then they're done for the day, and that's Amazing. all treated. That's all treated online. And uh, you know, another thing the insurance companies really love about that is our therapists can personalize and change a a treatment plan in real time. One of the reasons addiction treatment has a really low uh, success rate is it's really difficult to adapt to someone's changing needs as they're hitting their goals of their treatment plan and objectives of their therapy or not hitting them. But wouldn't um, – again, it all makes perfect sense. It's Great. a it, it's a – like such an incredibly sensible solution. I would have thought, I mean, a couple of our companies, we actually have some opioid clinics, yeah. uh, recovery clinics, but I would have thought like whether it's alcohol or whether it's opioid or whether it's anything, like, the clinics themselves, the recovery houses yeah. would also want to engage you so that they can keep their patients on the straight and narrow. I mean, that's going to be some of the marketing. It all depends on how the marketing is going to play out, right? Because so. cause they want to have the same thing. They, they want to have compliance, and they don't, they, they don't want people to relapse. Right. And the closer contacts you can keep with people, the less of a chance they have of relapsing. That's right. Okay, brilliant. So, look, talk to me a little bit about you. Okay. And not so much the struggles of building this, but it, it must have been, I mean, first of all, you're building something which emotionally is very close to you. Yeah, I love it. So there's a, like a huge mix of emotions going through. Yeah. Second, you were building it from nothing. Uh -huh. So how did you do that? How did you take it from, from the very beginning, create your team, raise the $100,000 uh -huh. that you raised to build uh -huh. the platform that you have now? I would love to take a bunch of credit for all of this. Go on, and, take it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but the truth is, is it's a, it's a pretty easy, like most people respond with, why isn't this done yet? You know, so um, I came back from Mexico uh, to take care of my mother for a few months. And I was living in Orange County where she's at um, and uh, talk, talking to a friend of mine, Chris Hennis, who's my CTO. And he said, Scott, what are, what are like the, your three best ideas right now? And I was like, well, it's this or this or maybe this planted recovery idea where we can help like people access recovery from wherever they are in the world, no matter what their situation is. And his eyes lit up and he's like, let's do that. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, I guess that's what we're doing. So we sat down and started to, you know, I, I actually moved in with them. And uh, we lived together for, you know, uh, six months classic. and just like, yeah, classic entrepreneurship, <laughs> his house, you know, he was, he was in life transition himself and his house became one big whiteboard and, uh, you know, we were just like, you know, on the walls and tech and, you know, what, what about this outcome and what about that outcome and, 
and and really just like you know there was so much validation to get done yeah you know there's like 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 is this a good idea you know are insurance companies going to do this with us yes are is the military interested in doing this yes with us? yes over and over and over again for you know all of that time and and um yeah, and that's sort of how I, I landed here. I was uh, doing a little bit of consulting and side work with Jake Ryan on Tradecraft. Yeah, no Jake. Well. And um, you know, he is, you know, he said, "Hey, I, you know, when when you're at the right point, then we should talk about getting into the expert dojo." And so here I am, and you know, we uh, got a little bit of money there. And you know, and as far you know, I'd like to talk about the struggle of it all. Of course, is you know, you're in uncharted territory. You know, we don't know what's going to work, right? Like I had. No idea how many people, you know, would actually sign up for an online outpatient program. I mean, in the first few days, it was, uh, no, no one wants to do that. They all want to be in person. Therapy needs to be delivered in person. And as we're actually finding out, that's not necessarily true. No, like I could I could see that. You know, and, and, and some of our competition, you know, I, I've glossed over some of your questions, but like some of our competition is like talk space where it's one-on-one -on -one therapy. You know, and they're great. They're a great app, but they don't have like a robust structured curriculum, you know, and uh, and they don't and and the, and the insurance companies are paying them per hour. Uh, we're negotiating for a daily rate, you know, and the numbers are pretty darn good. I mean, when you're talking like I mean, save should, a lot of money. Yeah. Should I, should I talk about the, the this year? I mean, one. Yes. I mean, please, yeah, because please. look, the objective of this podcast mm -hmm. is threefold. Number one is to inspire other entrepreneurs who are mm -hmm. building and they can see what the path looks like. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's for investors who are listening. They might be on their treadmill and they've got their headphones on and they just want to hear about potential companies that they feel could be good investment opportunities. Right. And I think your numbers are really important for that. And then third is just partners, people who can help. They can yeah. get involved as well. And I, and I do believe this is such an important area that people who have gone through recovery before mm -hmm. are extremely good targets for investors and people to get involved in this company yeah. because they've been through it. They yeah. understand yeah. exactly what's happened and how it needs to be fixed. But, yep. but even even from my perspective, who's not somebody who's gone through recovery, mm -hmm. I can understand that it makes total sense. Right. Telemedicine is not just here to stay. It's been here to stay for five years, yeah, right. 10 years maybe. Right. And and the solution that you have makes absolutely, the other solutions make absolutely no sense mm. because it's too hard. This isn't a, this isn't like breaking a leg where mm. six months time, it's all right, your leg's back again, you're right. fine, you're okay. This is a 20, 30, 40 year journey where you need to have support all the way through that journey. And you can't build in every single week to go for an hour or two hours. So yeah. I think it's a phenomenal solution. I Thank really you. do. Thank you. Yeah, the numbers, I mean, so just to put my business hat on, right? I mean, my personal hero's journey since, you know, I, I had my early uh, recovery, you know, ev every company I've started or been a part of, another company I started was Going Green Today, which is a sustainability platform. And that's something I was just coming off of when this idea came. But... Uh, that was a real hero's journey. That was tough. That one was tough. Yeah. I prefer planted recovery. Yeah, me too. Planted recovery is just a big problem that comes over to yeah. you in the form of like a seven-foot guy and punches you in the face it. because it's not being fixed. And it's a hidden problem. So nobody can see the true size of it. So I think you're hitting something. Well, green and sustainable. I love green and sustainable. Yeah. Half our products are green and sustainable. But it's a, it's a like. It's yeah. a want yeah. rather than a need. The, yeah. What you've hit right now is a big need. Big need. You know, so, yeah, I mean, the average uh, patient for a 12-week IOP is $16,704. Wow. Right? So when we start talking Tell everybody what an IOP is. Intensive Outpatient Program. Wow. So IOP, Intensive wow. Outpatient Program. And that's the third step in the care uh, plan, right? So detox, residential, IOP. Um, sorry for the jargon. I know. What's the alternative if they're going to do it online? Uh, there are like some sort of self-motivated classes to take. I think there's some uh, videos. I mean, to I mean, cost-wise. Oh, cost-wise. Yeah. What, what do you mean? That's it. That's well. That's what I'm negotiating right now. There is nothing. Like so, our our business plan right now is sixteen thousand seven hundred four dollars per person. Wow. And um, so we are actually where because it's digital platform and a digital health platform, we're able to uh, deliver cheaper. But what we're actually doing is filling that cost with more value. Wow. 
So we're bringing about four times more therapy to an individual than they would if they went in person to a place-based facility. Insurance companies love that. They're not necessarily looking. I mean, they love to save money, of course. Yeah. But my arg- our argument with them, our case for them, isn't necessarily to save money on the one time they do no, it. No, it's the relapse. It's the relapse. Yeah. Exactly. How, how many pe- What percentage of people relapse exactly. and what percentage of people are going to relapse with you? And That's the right. cost of that relapse is not $16,000. No, it's $160,000. Way $1, more. You're five relabs later. Yeah. And, you're right. So, yeah, 100%. Right. So yeah. that's that's the that was the sale for them. So. Um, our business plan starts off in year one. Once we're funded, we're looking for eight hundred thousand dollars. That Good, that was us, my next one. Yeah, yep, that brings us to uh, eighteen months of operations. That goes from product to service. We're a marketplace business model. So as soon as our product is done, we're delivering clinical services online. So that eight hundred grand brings us through that. We're currently at a two point five million valuation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've raised a hundred grand on that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, what we're planning on doing is with a small team in year one, I think 14 people is, is, is right. Um, uh, we can bring in approximately two and a half million in revenue uh, starting. And so that's like our pre We're considering that a pre-seed round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Makes sense. Then at 18 months, we're doing a seed round of about one point five million. And that's going to bring us through the next thousand clients. And wow. and um, so about two and a half years. And then uh, by year five, we are able to serve 2,000 clients annually. And, and what uh, kind of revenue would that bring in? About $34 million, <sighs> approximately. Jeez. And so that's a nice valuation. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Now, let's talk about 2,000. I mean, personally, I feel like we're going to blow that away really quickly. Like, we're going to surpass that. And I'm not – I'm trying I'm, – I'm saying 2,000 because the largest – IOPs, intensive outpatient programs, are uh, are uh, connected to hospitals, like Thelma McMillan in Torrance, for example. They see 200 clients a month. That's 2,400 a year. That's a place-based large IOP attached to a hospital. Our marketing uh, and sort of my plan on how to create the referral system, right? So the referrals are the trick here. Yeah. So you, uh, having an online IOP allows us to go to Salesforce. Uh, VP of Salesforce, one of our first clients or one of our first investors, uh, he went through the EAP program himself. You know, uh, we were able to put that call together really easily. Uh, you know, they have hundreds of thousands of uh, you know employees worldwide, and I, I think a hundred and something. Uh, easily ten percent of them are have addiction issues. So an EAP program is an employee assistance program, and it's one of those safe places you can run in a large corporation just before you get fired. Right. <laughs> and so they were, they, you know, so just kind of right when you know the ax is coming in, yeah, they're, they're, the jig is up, they know you have an, uh, an abuse issue of some kind, they go into the EAP program, and then the EAP program ideally refers them to another care. And we are l- working very diligently to become that primary option. Uh, and that's besides United Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente, um, TRICARE, Blue Cross Blue Shield Anthem, uh, you know, once we get contracts with them, we are able to start marketing directly to their uh, their customers as well. Fascinating. I love it. It's going to be lo- a big market. I love the model. I actually, you know what I want to do? I was thinking about this earlier on. I want to bring you over to our LP on Friday, actually. Uh-huh. I think you're going to really, really like this. Uh-huh. So Great. mark it in your diary for about 3.30. Great. We're gonna, we'll, we'll talk afterwards Great. because it's, I'm, I'm with you on the numbers. The numbers are absolutely yes. staggering. They are. I mean, this is, this is a, a potential unicorn for it's sure. It's an epidemic. I love I, it. I know. I, it's, it it's, it's one of those things where like, you know, my personal journey when we talk about it is to amplify the healing. I think I was kind of alluding to that a few minutes ago. Like, you know, we talk about the hero's journey and businesses I like to f- put together and, I, and I'm ready to, and I dedicate my life to um, are the kind of businesses where for every dollar you make, someone's a little better. So I have one question to ask you, and then I'd like to I'd like to give everybody contact details so they can catch you, and then maybe get a bit of advice in the end. Mm-hmm. My question is this: In your heart of hearts, mm-hmm. leaving aside the valuation of the company, potential mm-hmm. money, and everything else, yeah. what do you hope to reduce the relapse numbers to within five or ten years? Uh, and these are not projections or anything else. This is you. Yeah. Like, what is what is your life stream? That if you're like you're yeah. sitting you know, in your deathbed and like 
40 years time and you're looking yeah. back and you said, I did it. Yeah. What does I did it look like? I mean, I this is such a humble hope, but if I could double it, you know, right now we've got a real, uh, 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 let's look at the success rate. There's a success rate, uh, and depending on how you look at it, of uh, anywhere from 5 to 8%. Right. That's a lifetime success rate. That's a lifetime success okay. rate. That, that means people have relapsed a few times and come back and stayed in there, right? Um, if we can use technology... Oh, even if you relapse, as long as you long-term make yeah, it, like it the still Mayo, counts. The Mayo well, and Clinic. that's still only 5 to 8%? That's right. Jeez. That's right. The Mayo Clinic is, you know, obviously the preeminent sort of uh, 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 drug rehab in the world, and their success rate is 6.6. Crikey. And um, so, um, uh, yeah, if I could bring it to 15 and I believe it's possible. I believe that there's enough technology out there in the world. I'll give you an example that's really cool. Virtual reality. VR is coming. A VR rehab is coming, right? So how therapy and how clinicians are looking at potential use for virtual reality would be to have recreate someone's trigger point with the therapist there in your space. You walk into a crack house. You walk into a yelling mother. <laughs> you walk an into Irish, a bar. An Irish bar. <laughs> right, you walk into an oh, Irish bar. Oh, with a band in the corner. <laughs> and, I'm my best friend over there ex- sitting saying, come ex- on over. Let's do it. Come on, right. Brian. Exactly. The, and, and you, you got see, nowhere to go tonight. You're fine. And, and, Let's just stay at it. And you see it. You know, the blogger just gets oh, slid right oh, over to you on the bar, right? Oh, it's a Guinness, and, actually. A Guinness, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. And so, you know, at that point. In this particular, in this yeah. particular fantasy, you know, I could have an argument. Right, well, I'm this with you. this I'm with one, you on there's this one. a Guinness being passed across. So let's say in this moment, that Guinness is being passed across. You've got someone whispering in your ear who's actually tracking your biometrics and figuring out what cravings and oh, urgings wow. are actually your, your brain waves. Like, like the, 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 what's going to happen with technology five years from now with digital health is going to blow our mind. And, and That's pretty crazy, actually. Yeah. And the person who's talking in your ear is not your partner, because that's probably a person you're listening. Maybe it's your son. I mean, I don't mean it is a physical yeah. recreation of your son, but the feeling is of a person who's, you know, instilling something which is more important than that desire Isn't that amazing? to actually have that great evening. It can be like that. That's right. I mean, that, and that can be programmed. And do you think so, planted recovery can start moving in that direction? That's my goal. That's my, like that's my biggest dream. Okay, I want to leave it on that. I would like to. Uh, contact details. I want everybody to be able yeah. to contact you. Great. So uh, Scott Ankeny, Scott at plantedrecovery.com. Planted as in grow wherever you're at. Plantedrecovery.com. As in recovery stays forever. forever. And then also in your journey as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. if you take a piece of advice yeah. that encompasses everything that you've gone <laughs> through over the period that you're going to pass on to other entrepreneurs, what would that be? Uh, don't fear the pivot. You know, there have been a couple of projects in the past where I just was like, I'm going to win. <laughs> and, 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 people, yeah. and people come along and they're like, yeah, you are going to win, but maybe try this. No, I'm going to win <laughs> my way. And, uh, you know, if I had just not held on and, and kind of, Im- and the investigation and, you know, the research of, of what a pivot might mean and, you know, I think, uh, I but think today you were in a place where all those breadcrumbs have led that's right. to your finest moment, which is this moment, moment right now. That's right. That's it's right. a pleasure to know you. I'm really glad Thank we you, had this podcast, not just like for being able to pass the message out to everybody listening, because I think it's an important message, yeah. but also for me, because I think it's a friggin' awesome business. <laughs> and I'm thinking of the investors that we can get you introduced to. I love it. Thank <laughs> you. That's why I came to you, man. Well, I appreciate it. Keep on trucking. Great, okay. Great that's community. a wrap. Thanks for joining us. If you love the podcast, please empower your circle by sharing these stories. The Art of Startup War is brought to you by Expert Dojo. And remember, we invest in startups, $50,000 checks. Make sure you apply on our site if you are one of those great entrepreneurs looking to bring your company to the next level. As far as the Art of Startup War is concerned, we are back every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. So remember... Check out the new episodes. If you want to find out what the investors think, check out season one or two. But make sure you join us every single week.